I'm Trina Carlson. I'm the uh, president of the Historical Society. And tonight we have the great honor of uh, welcoming Kevin Moreau and Thomas Boucher. They worked together and, um, as master and apprentice for a year studying and making handmade locks. They were awarded a grant as a team from the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts for their pursuit. This presentation chronicles what was um, covered and the pieces that Thomas created under Kevin's guidance. So we're very excited to see this presentation. Enjoy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, so yeah, thanks to the Northwood Historical Society for hosting this. Um, and thank you for the use of the uh, projector from the Chesley Memorial, Memorial Library. Um, yeah, that's a huge help. So I have a bunch of stuff on the table here. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to check it out. And I've got some stuff for sale in the back too. But um, So this is mostly what we'll be talking about. I have some of my older locks as well as stuff Kevin's made. Um, we have some original locks, which most of those are things that we referenced or um, I guess sort of copied for the ones that we made for the purpose of the, the grant. And then the ones that I made and then various tooling and, and sample pieces, stuff that I, I didn't quite like the quality of put into my lock. So if you want to come up and take a look, go ahead. Um, so I want to give a special thank you to Kevin for agreeing to do this with me. Um, he had no idea who I was. And I reached out to him and said, hey, would you like to apply for this? Because um, we applied as a team. And he graciously accepted. Um, I wanted to say thanks to Kayla for letting me know about this. Um, I was demonstrating at Blasty Bow, which is a brewery up the road. And she approached me and said, hey, we have this grant opportunity. So I looked into it, and it turns out it was a great thing. Um, so as part of my application, I had to have some people write letters of recommendation for me. So um, two of those people aren't here. So Mark Hopper um, was a teacher that I had down in Georgia. Um, Seth Gould is a metal worker um, down in North Carolina. And uh, Lloyd, who drove all the way up in Georgia to be here for this. <laughs> thank you. Um, he wrote me one. And then my father wrote me one. And I also have to thank my dad for dealing with all my projects everywhere, all over the shop for a year while I did all this, and helping me out in tons of ways. Um, and thanks for the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts again for allowing me to do this. Um, and then some other people that helped me with giving me something or giving me information corresponding with me. Um, Russell Pope for giving me that Grimlock. I actually referenced that, it was good, it was good help. Um, Jordan Goodwin, he gave me tons of reference information, photos, measurements and stuff for the doorknobs for my rim lock because um, I could not find real ones to, um, to reference for that. Um, Doug McQueen for sending me a key, which you'll see in my presentation, we looked at some of the wording in it. Um, Peter Ross and Ken Schwartz, both from Williamsburg, um, they gave me some good information on rim locks um, and reference material for that. Uh, my friend Steve Mancini, who's not here, he gave me another rim lock. Um, Nick Downing, who couldn't be here, he um, helped me learn how to do brass casting, which I, I did on one of my locks. And then uh, Scott Martin for letting me check out some of the stuff in his house, some of his locks. Uh, and of course, I have to thank my wife for <laughs> going along with me doing all this uh, for a year. She was really supportive, so thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm Thomas Boucher, by the way. Um, so I've been blacksmithing since 2012. Um, and I actually started on Lloyd and Betty's porch down in Georgia. Um, and I've always been more interested in utilitarian kind of stuff. And locks were interesting to me, but I never really knew anything about them, kind of how to do them. And I slowly found a little information and just started kind of making more of them. And through my various internet searches of trying to find stuff about him, I came across Kevin's work. That's all he does, is makes the handmade locks. <clears throat> so I immediately knew that he was the one I wanted to reach out to for this. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just I love making locks. They're a lot of fun. They're, they're like a puzzle for me to kind of figure out how the parts fit together and how they work and that kind of stuff. So yeah. Um, when 
I guess I'll give my little story. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, originally got into ironworking and blacksmithing by uh, bladesmithing. I saw the Three Musketeers movie when I was 14, and oh my God, it changed my life. And here were these these really manly men, but they were dressed in you know, big floppy hats with feathers and lace and ribbons and so forth. <laughs> big long swords. So I wanted to make the swords and I slowly, you know, uh, got wherever I had an opportunity to, to begin. I, I began uh, by going back to my old high school and working in the metal shop and made blades and then, uh, then I finally got a job at a blacksmith shop in Brattleboro, Vermont, where I worked for a total of eight years. And at a certain point, I stopped making blades. I decided I didn't want to make swords and knives anymore. And I tried to leave the trade. <laughs> they wouldn't let me. <laughs> uh, after working for a boat builder for three years, doing mostly metalworking, um, I started a small blacksmith shop, and I wanted to specialize in, in work that was no larger than my head because iron gets heavy. <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh, locks, keys, they, they'd use all of the, the fine uh, iron working skills that I learned by bladesmithing, uh, polishing, heat treating, uh, working to really close tolerances for fitting guards and, and handles together. I thought, wow, and then there are these things that come with locks, these beautiful little pieces of removable art called keys that are just fascinating. So I, I started making locks using what I had learned as a blacksmith, a production blacksmith, uh, to intuit a lot of the techniques necessary, and uh, I've been doing it for 20 years. I've mostly been working in a, a continental European style, but some of the first locks I made were English, and that was the um, the focus of this uh, project was English locks from the colonial period and the period of uh, the early republic in New Hampshire, uh, well, not specifically in New Hampshire, but what would have been commonly found or imported to New Hampshire. Uh, and the, some of the, the skills that a general blacksmith might need to work on the locks that were being imported to the colonies and, and, and to the New Republic because there was very little actual lock making happening in the, uh, the very young United States. It, it didn't really get off the ground until the 1820s, mostly in the major cities like Philadelphia and New York. And, uh, and I, to th I don't know about Boston. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so, so the purpose of the grant. Um, if you don't mind if I read this, the traditional artist apprenticeship grant helps communities preserve their cultural heritage through traditional crafts, music, and dance so that future generations can continue to benefit from them. Apprenticeship grants fund a master traditional artist to teach an experienced apprentice to one, uh, in one-to-one -one sessions over a period of six to ten months. Traditional arts are an important part of our living cultural heritage and represent a sense of beauty, skills, knowledge, and community values refined over generations. So, um, the big reason why I applied, um, and especially for the locks, is because it's hard to find information on lock making. Like Kevin said, most of it wasn't done here. Um, it was cheaper to import them from England. Um, so there's just not a lot of information. There's not a lot of books. There's not a lot of you know, stuff written down about how to do it. And they're kind of hard to find, to be honest, like a 300-year-old a lock. So, Anywhere I can get information from is super helpful, and I've scoured the internet and tried to find whatever books I can find. So being able to work with Kevin, who has a lot of this knowledge from his experience and what he's found for information, is just really helpful. It just it 
just cut my like learning curve way down to be able to just get the information directly from somebody rather than having to keep pick around for this information wherever I can sort of find it. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's the biggest reason. So, something that I learned about locksmithing in general and lock making is that it was always a secretive trade because it involved security and you didn't go out and you know give away all the secrets to people who might be able to use those you know understand the technology what went on inside the box when you put the key in and turned or didn't turn um, so they guarded the knowledge of both of what was actually happening in the mechanisms and um, and the techniques used to make things, especially in Europe, uh, although to a degree in England. So there isn't much information written about locks from the pre-industrial age, which is really concentrated. Um, another reason that um, Peter Ross gives, um, he has some videos which I'll reference a little bit here, is that he says um, it's a lot easier to learn from somebody else how to do something. It's a lot easier to do that than to read from a book. So there was no sense to write down a book of how to make locks when there was the apprenticeship programs. So you just went to a master and he taught you directly. So there's no books because it wasn't written down. You just you just learned from somebody directly. So or that is at least his take on and probably why there isn't. Um, so the locks that we covered are um, an English chess lock, a padlock, a double chambered padlock, a um, stock lock, and a three bolt rim lock. And the reason why we picked those locks is because that's what would have been found here in New Hampshire. Um, they would have all been English because we were an English colony. Um, so those are the locks we focused on. <coughs> so we, um, <coughs> excuse me, we met 18 times, but 17 of those times was directly working. And we met for a total of 91 hours. Um, while working. So we had to meet for a minimum of 65 and like it says um, a 6 to 10 month period. We actually went a little over. We met for basically a year. Um, kind of every two to three weeks I yeah. probably went. Yeah. To, he's His shop's in Vermont um, here in Northwood. So we met a couple times a month and then I, I he showed me stuff and then I worked on it to try to finish up whatever we kind of covered or get to the next step. So when I went back we could go on to like the next thing. Um, that's what we did. All right. So <laughs> most of what I'm covering in the slideshow is pictures I took along the whole process. So um, a lot of this is on my Instagram. Some of it's um, specific to this, but a lot of it's on there. So if you want to see more of this again or look into it further and take a look at it again, if you haven't, my Instagram is Greasy Luck Forge, and you can grab a, a business card or something that has the info. So you can go back through and pretty much see the whole process, everything I did. I, I kept putting pictures all the time. Um, oh yeah. So, um, some good reference material that I had. Uh, the book on the left, A Study of Service Mounted Door Locks. Um, it doesn't get into like the construction of them really, but it talks about kind of the, um, the details of them. So like the characteristics of different time period ones, because they change a little bit. And it has a lot of really good photos. The pictures are, the quality <coughs> is okay. They almost look like they're photocopied, but it has a lot of pictures and it just gives really good information in categorizing different types of locks. Um, and then the APT Bulletin, uh, the Association for Preserve, uh, Preservation Technologies, this issue has an article from Donald Streeter, who was a really well-known blacksmith, and he does cover a lot of um, the characteristics of how they're made sort of. He, he doesn't necessarily talk about the forging process of it, but he talks about this piece is shaped this way or, or has this thing or whatever. So he goes into a lot of really good detail um, in that article. <clears throat> this issue of Antiques Magazine, again, has another Donald Streeter article on stock lots. So that one was a good one to check out. Um, and then this is his book. There's a little section on a rim lock and a, maybe a stock lock in there. And again, there's just little nuggets of information, but none of these things are, are kind of enough to give you the whole picture. You just, like I said, you're just kind of finding little bits of information here and there. So these are really good um, sources for some of that stuff that I, I referenced during this. And then these are the videos I was talking about with Peter Ross on YouTube. 
So from the 2014 Rocky Mountain Smith Conference, they have these three videos of him. And in, I think two of them, he's actually forging and showing pieces and stuff. And one of them, it's a good talk. It, it's, he's basically just talking about the work he did at Colonial Williamsburg and the work that um, they were sort of emulating. So what the Smiths in the 18th century would have actually been doing and um, that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a good talk. So um, the single piece key that I made, it was used for the chest lock and for the padlocks that I did. Um, so these were forged from a single piece, um, two forge welds. I folded the bit and forge welded it on, and the bow was split and wrapped and welded at the top. Do you think we might want to just say a little word about forge welding for people who don't know yeah. the term? Sure. It's where, in, in uh, rather than introducing uh, a, a metal like in in modern arc welding or gas welding, where you heat the pieces up to the point where they'll fuse or or actually accept a, a molten third piece of metal like a filler rod, the in forge welding, uh, as the name would suggest, it's done right in the fire, the forge fire. Uh, pieces of metal are brought to a point where the surfaces actually become sticky. It's about you know, 1900 degrees or so. And actually forged or hammered together at that heat. So it's, it's a little tricky. A lot of smiths <laughs> yeah. struggle with it, but it's a great skill. <laughs> So in the top picture here, this is kind of my rough forging of doing the bit. So they started out as 3 8 square material. So at the top here, I um, just kind of nicked it and folded the material over, and the weld is here. Um, so those are just a couple of blanks that I, um, I did up. And I have a swage, which I think you'll see on the next slide, and it's on the table, which is how I, I got sort of the shape between the bit and the roundness of the stem. Um, so this is showing you drilling the hollow bit of the stem. And then this, this is the original key that um, Kevin had with his padlock that we were referencing. So you can see I'm trying to match kind of the proportions of it. Um, and I left the mass up here so I could split it and wrap it around and weld it here. And then this is a, a roughly finished key. You can see some of the detail filed into it. So that's the swage I was talking about. So the end up here, you can see the, the mass missing at the end. That's to shape the bit of the key. And then there's this round. Um, section just to work on the rest of the stem to draw it out round. So here's like a close up you can see like I was talking about. <clears throat> so and this is a video, hopefully the speakers aren't too loud, I didn't get to test them. This is a video of Kevin um, showing me how to forge what's called a Georgian wire bow. So this, this shape of a bow, which is what we have on all the keys that we did. Splitting it open, that's, the, that's going to be the eye. So here he's kind of starting to open it up more, upsetting those ends in so it's flat on the bottom instead of having that pinch. And then shaping it on the horn. And this process takes much longer than this, I just cut it down real quick. So there he was kind of scarfing it, which is where he'll have the overlap for the weld. He's fluxing it now, which that helps to keep the weld area clean. <coughs> and now he's forge welding it making sure those are blended in together. He's drawing out the sides of the bow to thin them out and shape them. And here he's doing some more shaping. So that's basically a really quick version of kind of how that process goes. It's <laughs> like magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here you can see, um, this is kind of a rough forged key, and then this is a finished up one. So I've got the, the ward cut, and I've got the details all filed out. Everything's all shined up. And then this is just to show you that the ward itself is not just a straight cut. It actually is radius. And that helps it to, to be closer to the, the wards inside the lock. It's a little more secure. Thomas is uh, gaining notoriety <coughs> among the uh, artist locksmithing crowd because he's one of the first ones to actually make tiny radius chisels for cutting the radius 
So I have pictures of those I'll show in a minute, but it's interesting when I, so Kevin, right, you moderate that group, I think, the Facebook group? Yeah. So there's a Facebook group of called Artist Locksmiths, and when I first joined it, I think they were actually discussing, well, how did they do that? Because they used to actually do that. If you look at old keys, not all of them, but if you look at a lot of old keys, they're, they're radiused inside the wards, and nobody really quite knows how they did, they did it. Um, it's just kind of known for some reason that it was cut with chisels, but no one's ever seen, well, those are locksmith chisels. No one's seen anyone do it. Um, so I just did it, because it was done with chisels, so I tried it. It's literally all it was. And it worked. <laughs> so I was kind of making it up as I went. I didn't quite know what they would look like, but I assumed, and I made so much of what I thought, and they worked, and I made a couple alterations, and yeah, it went fine. So. A lot of our techniques, a lot of my techniques, and, and now Thomas's are what I would call forensic um, locksmithing. Or, and blacksmiths uh, know all about this. We'll look at a piece from two or three or four hundred years ago, or the, even the medieval period, and we'll, so we'll go, well, how did they make that? We know that there are only a few different ways of shaping iron, and we piece it together by, by what we do now. And I do have a slide that I'll get to in a little bit with, so the key that I referenced that Doug McQueen sent, <coughs> excuse me, and it shows the tool marks for cutting the wards so we can intuit while well, it had to have been sort of this way. So we'll, I'll show that in a little bit. So the first lock, like I said, the, the single piece key that we just talked about was used for this chest lock. So the view of the lock you're seeing here would actually be, the lock would be inside the chest. So that would be facing out, but it's inside the chest. So you wouldn't actually see it. You would just see the keyhole and the, the post coming out. So here's my drawing, um, or my plan as to <coughs> reference for like how the shapes of the parts are and stuff, the sizing of them. And of course, once you start actually making stuff, things can change a little bit. Um, but this is a good, a good guide. So this is the front view, basically, we were just looking at. And I, I drew the, <clears throat> the bolt in red just so I could pick it out a little easier for myself because you can see the two arcs here. And that lets me know kind of the, the travel of the key. So um, it's just easier if I, if I drew it up for myself that way. And this is a side view, so I knew the depth of it. And then <clears throat> this piece up here, uh, this piece is the, I guess, the housing or the frame, the frame, the frame for it. The body. And then this piece is the catch that would be on the lid. So this, this piece here comes down into this area of the lock. And that's how it, it locks. So Kevin, are your schematics uh, uh, rough? Are they with the computer assisted drafting? Uh, I, when I draw, I draw by hand. So, 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 uh, okay. I do them on the computer. Okay. But for the purpose of this, like Kevin said, he does it by hand. So that's the way he showed me. So I have my sketchbook on the table as well that has the designs that are on here as well as um, for the rim lock only, I have multiple pages kind of drawing um, all the, most of the parts in like two views. But again, so I can reference them so I know um, how, how deep they need to be and all that kind of stuff. But I, I do my own stuff on the computer just because that's what's uh, comfortable to me. So here's a look um, of it with the, the cover plate off so you can sort of see it's a pretty simple lock. I mean, it's just got the post of so the Halston key pivots on that and the bolt. So the key comes up into the bolt here and throws it. So here's the, the catch that would be on the lid. So that's it in the lock position. And it's just got a simple spring. It's a pretty, pretty simple lock. The, uh, the way it remains locked or unlocked is that the spring pushes down uh, um, and keeps the, the this is like a lump a lump on the tail of the bolt uh, keeps it in either position uh, against the, the opening of the frame. It's a very simple lock. It's called a I guess it's called a back sprung deadbolt. So here's um, a picture of the finished lock and the finished key. <coughs> So then the next lock we did, the double chamber padlock, and it's called that because it has two chambers. So the key 
goes in, throws the first bolt, and then there's a certain position where it can go in further, and then it opens the second bolt. Um, and he had, so for the, the chest lock, we didn't have an original per se, we had one that Kevin made uh, a number of years ago that we referenced, but it's um, just as good as an original one would be. And then, so for this we had an antique lock, which you say is early 1800s? Yeah, I, uh, uh about 1820. Uh, it's it's uh, of a style that seems to have been uh, made in England starting in the 1700s, probably early 1700s. Um, and it's of a type that was uh, probably continued until the 1840s. Um, and a couple of examples have been found uh, in a shipwreck in the Delaware River dating from around 1780. And they're, they're, they, the shape of the lock body changes slightly over time. The earlier ones are rather bag-shaped, and the later ones are more heart-shaped. And the one that we copied, uh, well, well, the one, the original that we have uh, is more of a heart-shaped to the later type. And the, the original one's on the table. <clears throat> I brought all the locks that we were, we were referencing from. So this is the, the original one. So you can see, like he's saying, this is a little more heart-shaped rather than some of them are really rounded. Um, so then we took it apart to kind of look at some of the internals once we know kind of how they're working. And then <clears throat> to get an idea of how they made them. So for instance, one of the things, this piece here that the two bolts are going through is called a standard. <clears throat> and we were able to tell what order they put them into the lock because you can see on this one that's on the nose end of the bolt, um, down here there were marks from the vise biting into it. And you can't do that if there's, there's bolts in it. So we know that that one went in first. The other one, so this one, so th this one is on this side this year. So this is the nose and this is the tail of the bolt. So the one on the tail end, only the top about right here had bite marks from the jaws of the vise because you can't bite any further because of the bolt. So we know what order they put them in. So that's where you're saying forensically found stuff. So you, we take them apart and look at them. You can study the tool markings on them so you, you can get an idea of how they were made. Um, some things are easier to discover than, some, than other things, but you can get a pretty good idea on um, quite a bit. Again, like even just stuff as basic as this, um, I guess the chamber separator. The bottom of it's just really rough. You can even see right here this little like rough cut from the chisel. So you know that this was just chisel cut. And it's not important. It's inside the lock. It's not functioning to anything. So it can be rough. So this is um, a video of me cutting out my face plates for that by, um, by hand with a chisel. So you just kind of mark, you don't cut all the way through, you, you go most of the way, probably two thirds or so the way through. And then here I'm just cutting reliefs, so that way I can snap off the excess and it'll just, it'll have a place to break off. So you just put it in a vise and just kind of wriggle it back and forth, and if you cut far enough through then it, it just work hardens and snaps off eventually. <coughs> so here I'm just cutting it off so I can access that other side easier. And I don't think I cut through all the way. So they just snap off. And it's a much quicker way to do it than if you were to try to like cut this out with a hacksaw or something. Like. So this is some tooling that I made specifically for working on that lock. Um, so these two tools here have two different sizes, a 3 16 and a quarter. And these are, uh, these are a tool you developed, I guess, basically, right, this, this shape of it. So this is what's called a double butcher. And so a butcher, it's angled on one side and flat on the other side, and that allows you to neck in a piece of material real precisely to one side, um, rather than if you just use a regular hot cut is what it's called for just cutting a piece of hot metal off. They're usually tapered on both sides, so then you, you would have, I guess, that taper on your piece. So we wanted to have a nice hard 90 degree shoulder. So on two sides, so this allowed, allowed you to have the two hard shoulders. So this is used for making um, what Kevin, there is one on the table, what's called um, a T-rivet. So 
it puts that little lump at the bottom there. And that is what um, allows you, so the lump in the middle, it, it um, gets riveted to the frame, so the side of the lock, and then the two ends get riveted to the face plates. So that's how you kind of construct the body of the lock. <clears throat> and these tools were also used for my rim lock. I made what's called a rim rivet. The only difference being is that it gets riveted through one side or one end and the stub in the middle. So that one has three rivet uh, ends and the rim rivet has two. So these two tools in the middle, these are just bending forks that I can put in my um, vise. And those allow me to bend the shape of the frame. Um, so I, I made a tighter one. I made a tighter one just because sometimes you bend it with the T rivets attached. So getting up close to those sometimes is hard with this wider one. So I made a tighter one. And then this is a die that I made um, for the keyhole cover on one of the locks. So I made I made a keyhole cover. Or I made two padlocks. One has a keyhole cover that closely matches the original example that Kevin has. And then this one is on the other one. And the pattern for it I actually got from a picture of an 18th century lock. So it's not something I just made up, but we didn't have an actual physical reference for it, but I referenced it from a, a picture. So this is a video of me demonstrating how the rim rivet, or the T-rivet tool works. <clears throat> So you just forge the material in there, and it's because of that butcher, it, it leaves the, the nub in the middle, and then you get sort of this half bow tie shaped piece. And then those two sides get drawn out. So I'm just flattening it out here. And then I, I'm using the anvil block so I can get close up. It's got a hard edge. And then I'm cutting it off. And then I can get to the other side, straighten it out, flatten it out. So that's a, a T rivet forging. And then the, the ends get filed up to be round or some of them are square. <clears throat> so then here you can see um, this is the, the frame for the padlock and then you can see the four T rivets and the ends of them have been filed to round tenons. And the edge ones I left square. So there you can see it bent up and fit to the plate. Um, so basically, you start with this one, drill the hole for it or punch the hole, bend this with my forks until you get the placement of this one, mark it, put that hole in there, and you keep going until you've got them all fit in there. And then you can transfer the holes from the one plate to the other plate, and they should be pretty close, but you can, you can move them around a little bit with a punch. You can move a little mass and file out what you need to. On, uh, on original that I've taken apart often, the, you can see where they adjusted the, <laughs> the alignment by bending the rivet to, to the fit. Yeah, so, so it's not per perfectly, uh, perpendicular. So this is the original um, shackle in the lock that we're referencing. And so you can get an indication of some of the, the way it's made. So there's this line here, which is from a forge weld. Something that we're unsure of. It's hard to tell. Kevin thinks that maybe the piece was just folded over and welded. I kind of think that it might be a second piece welded on, like this might be a seam here. It's really hard to tell on this one. So, And then you can see this little pinch right here, that's a, a weld seam as well. <coughs> so this is a video of Kevin forging one. This is the, the workshop. Yeah, the Kevin <laughs> shop. So right now he's doing a set down to make that eye. Just flattening out the material, squaring it up, folding it over. So this will be that hinge, the pivot part for the shackle. So putting a drift in there to shape it too. Putting some flux on it again to keep his um, weld clean. Forge welding it. Now he's doing the set down for the other end that the bolts pass through. It's basically the same forging until before bending it or whatever you do the other side. A little bending jig to shape it. And then comparing it to the lock to see if it, it fits. If you need to tweak it, whatever you gotta do to make it fit. What is the flux? We use, <coughs> I use 20 mule team borax 
just straight out of the box. I guess um, they used to use sand sometimes traditionally. Or, yeah, sand is a really good flux mm -hmm. for wrought iron, which is what they were using. We're right. using steel. modern yeah. low carbon or hot rolled steel, so it's about. 0.25% carbon, whereas the wrought iron is just this beautiful skein of, of iron grains in an iron silicate slag. And iron silicate is basically its own flux. So that's why clean sand works perfectly. It just it forms a perfect. It's great. It just draws all the impurities out as you pound it together, and it's one piece of iron out. There, there were some um, commercially available fluxes as well. I don't know what they were necessarily made of, but some of them had iron filings and stuff in them too. Um, but yeah, we just use borax now. So this is the original one, and this is um, one of the ones that I forged, just kind of showing a comparison. Um, you can see on mine, I, I did forge weld a separate piece on for the seam there. You, you can kind of make up a little bit of the seam here from the, the eye. So there's um, the first one that I made. So once you've got the frame and you've got the shackle, then you can start sort of fitting um, where the bolts are going to go and locating the standards and putting them in there. And so part of locating it, you can see the scribe line here for the, the arc of the key. So it's important, the talons here on the bolt, where they lie. So when the key's coming this way, this the, the talon needs to be outside of the arc of the key so that the key can go in here, pick up this talon, and throw the bolt over. And this one falls right outside the arc here. And that way when the key goes back to, to throw it the other direction, it'll catch this one because that'll be intersecting um, the, the arc here somewhere. So <clears throat> once you have some of these parts you start figuring out where the other parts go to them. So it's not as easy as just having like a template, this is where the holes go. You kind of make the parts to fit this particular law. And that would be the case with all of them. So it's, <clears throat> it's pretty common um, if you have an old lock to find inside where they might have numbered parts because the bolt for lock number two might not fit lock number three. So you, you mark them. Often they had hash marks uh, or, or punch marks, just the number. Sometimes you can see that they used a, a Roman numeral numbering system for the parts as well. <clears throat> so this was just taking a look again at the bolts and the standard. So again, another thing that we found in looking at this standard is you can see this beveled edge on top. So that tells me that was just cut off on a hot cut on the anvil. Um, so I did the same. I have the beveled <coughs> edge here. You can see that the edges on the, the holes here bulge out, which that would be from punching it because that material would be displaced a little bit. So I punched mine, you can see they bulged out. <coughs> and then these are the bolts. So these again, like Kevin was saying earlier, this is a back sprung bolt because it's got the spring as part of it up on the back. So this is forged out from one piece. This was a long drawn out piece that was then bent over. Um, and so this lock actually, the bolt and the spring, they're just mild steel because they don't flex that much. They don't have to be a, a hard spring steel. Um, so I did experiment with making one out of spring steel, but it just wasn't necessary. We found also on the original that it wasn't a, a, a hard or a, a carbon steel product. It was, it was made from iron and just the spring in the in the uh, drawn out iron was enough. We, we, we actually moved it with a screwdriver. We, we adjusted what one of the lot, one of the bolts in the original when I got it didn't work. It was all floppy. And uh, when we took it apart to, to study it, I, I levered it up and it started working again. <laughs> <laughs> Everything back then was meant to be repaired, also. Um, so this is a look at the, the chamber separator. Um, so here it is just scribed on my plate before cutting out. And again, like I said earlier, <coughs> the bottom of it was just roughly cut with a chisel. It didn't need to be anything um, precise. 
And then you can see here um, two punch marks for my ward, which is up here. That's just a little curved piece. And that corresponds to the cut in the key. Um, so that's sort of the security of it. Then that's installed. Um, so the, um, the hole here, the keyhole on the chamber separator also acts as a, um, a registration area for the key. The key has just a tiny bit of a nub sticking out. So it can register in there to turn around. And it is on a post as well. But, um, so again, here's uh, my die for making the keyhole cover. And this, is, this was my masterpiece that I filed out, which I used to forge into the block here for the shape. And then this is the, the piece that I used the die to forge, which is the piece on my lock. So there's the lock um, finished up. And this one, you can really see all the, the, top, the heads of the T rivets because I made this one so I could take it apart so I can kind of show people how it works inside and use it as a reference for myself as well. And uh, I should note, the shape on this one, I guess this is your pattern, right, Kevin? So that's why it's a little differently shaped. Um, and then this is one that I, I made based off of the, the shape of the original one. So you can see it's a little less round. It's a little, like he said, more heart-shaped. And the keyhole cover is different because it's um, it's shaped like the original one, which this one I just filed, and I didn't have a, a die for it. <clears throat> so then we get into the uh, Georgian wire bow key for um, the stock lock and the rim lock. Um, I think typically the English made these from one piece, um, and I think that they might have actually punched the eye rather than splitting it and forge welding it, but I think you've kind of seen it both ways, right? Yes, I've seen it both ways, and originally they were forged and either forge welded or on smaller ones punched. But during the, say, 18 or uh, 1750 to 1790 uh, period, they started using uh, fly presses, which are huge presses with a very uh, fast threaded screw and you just turn this thing and there's a big weight on a wheel and it just goes boom and they started actually making dies for keys so they put in a piece <coughs> of wrought iron the right size and go boom and the key would be formed on the end and then they they trim up the flash turn it on a lathe and uh, and finish it and it would be ready for cutting. But so that was, that was <coughs> another, uh, sort of a, an industrial uh, or early industrial age method that, that overtook the hand forging. So some of the characteristics of these keys, I mean, they have just kind of this general overall look. And this was a, an original key that I bought for reference. Um, so some things about it is they have this little swell at the bottom of the, the top of the bow. Um, in through this section of the bow, they do kind of become round like a wire. And then down here, they kind of flatten out and swell again. Um, and then they have sort of this decoration here, and then this swell right here. And then this plate right here is a bearing surface. So that's how this key registers itself. So the key goes into the lock only that far. And that's how all the wards are able to line up. Um, one of the things that Kevin taught me, I think even before we started this, the trip I went out there, he was just sort of showing me that, so like, with a French key, they don't have this bearing surface. Their stems are just straight, but um, this should say symmetrical. But with these keys, if you look at the end of the bit, it's like a teardrop shape. Um, so really, it can go in the lock either way, and the keyhole is cut that way, and there's, so there's nothing to stop it. That's what the bearing surface is for. But with a French key, the bits are asymmetrical. So the keyhole doesn't pass all the way through like these do. So that's what um, registers the key. So it can only go so far because that bit hits the back side of the lock and it can't go through. So that's one of the differences between some of the, the regional keys. <coughs> so here's just sort of some of the process of my key. So this is a rough forging. You can see I'm setting up like um, for the next processes. So here I've got the bottom of the bow and this will be split out to be forge welded on top. I've got my mask down here for the swell, the decoration, and then this is my bearing surface. And then this part of the material is drawn down to be the bottom of the stem where the bit will be attached. 
And then so this is with the um, the bow split and then welded and, and roughly shaped by forging. And then here's all cleaned up, turned the decorations and, and filed, ready to have the, the bit um, brazed on. So like I said, originally I think a lot of theirs were single piece, although have you did you say you've seen some brazed on? I can't remember. I, I believe I have. It's, it, it is, this is more of a, a hybrid uh, <laughs> construction method that we, we went for simply because of a time constraint. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think the tough, bit, the tough part is getting the, uh, uh, where do I, okay, but which end? Okay, don't do it in my eye. <laughs> uh, the, getting this portion, uh, I've never done it out of one piece to actually end up with that nice bearing. It, it's something I never learned how to do. Um, we'd probably have to talk to Peter Ross. Yeah, but he has cast keys. Oh, he has cast keys. He's, he's cheating too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to further uh, explain that too, if you look at my original key, which is the, the front, or the key that I made rather, is the one on the front uh, right hand corner here in front of my rim lock. That section right here is maybe 3 30 seconds tall. Yeah. So it's a pretty tight area to kind of really get into. You can get into it with a needle file, but it's still tough. So to get that really nice and clean and a nice crisp edge for that, again, to register and bear on, it's, it's a little hard, so. But here's, um, here's my key prepped for um, having, this is the bit, so I've got um, a section filed flat and then the holes drilled through for the tenons here and this is flat so it, it's a pretty tight fit and we rivet it on that way it's mechanically held there so when you go to braise it um, it doesn't just fall apart in the fire because that's that's a really hard thing to do some people wrap stuff with wire I've never had luck with that the wire loosens up your pieces come apart and they brace crooked or they're not even together to be brazed so and, and I, I found also that, that when bronze melts in a fire, it's a really good lubricant between two pieces of steel. <laughs> and, yeah. and I've had the bits on keys spin wildly out of control. So this is a video. I'm hoping the sound will be good enough. If not, then I can kind of say what he's saying. But this is a video, uh, I believe, of Kevin going through the forge brazing process. So. What he's saying is, is pretty important because the picture doesn't change a lot. It's more sort of what he's saying, but hopefully it's... What I'm doing here is making myself a little pocket, a little bowl. In the, in you the guys corner. hear that? So I can easily get these to be braided in without having all kinds of stuff around. in the fire and then, since this is a, a fairly massive piece of steel uh, it's going to take a little while to, uh, to warm up but I want it to warm up slowly and keep it to heat and while I'm doing that I'm going to heat up my bronze rod or brazen rod so that I Stick it in the flux, and I can have flux all over it. But I have it right by me here. here. I'm going to turn the heat through the fire and make sure it's heated up even more. So this is heating the heat up when it's flipping up to get air. But as soon as that's up to a, a temperature where it's blowing, the flux will stick. If I can get it a little hotter than that, the flux will actually run. And it will, the capillary action will draw it in between the, the stem and the bow and up into the little, uh, the little tenons. Because it's not a, a perfect fit. You see the stem is glowing pretty nicely. So I'm going to take it out. Just run the, the flux rod. So 
So he's just getting fucked on all the seams. Along that joint, and this joint here. Yeah, you be careful not to burn myself. <laughs> because you could maybe hear the fan going. That was his forge blower. So it was, I, on the, the video edit, I tried to knock that sound down so you could hear him more, and it, but it takes it off some. It's a, it's a hard thing to, to get. But basically what he was saying was he made a pocket, like a bowl in the fire, um, so that way his piece could fit in there, get it nice and hot, and he could see what he was doing rather than typically when you're getting a piece hot to forge it, it's all covered and you can't really see it. So he had a nice bowl there, and he was getting the piece up to temperature. Um, he just quickly heated up the, the bronze, stuck it in the flux that was covered, so he could use that to apply it to the bit. And then, again, he put it back in the fire to bring it up to the actual temperature it needed, and then he was dabbing the bronze on, and when that got to the perfect temperature, it just flowed in. And through capillary action, that bronze is sucked in through all the little seams and stuff. Um, and then he just cleaned it up. Basically what he was saying. Right? Yep. Yeah. So there it is. There's my key. Um, and we have an original that we base this off of. Um, so it's hard to tell with this because it's all dirty now, but basically the stem was cleaned up really well even though we were going to throw it back in the forge because it just allows you to clean it up a little better. And one thing he said at the end of the video is this process, it leaves just kind of a thin cover of the bronze rather than if you try to do a lot of times with people use torches to braise mm -hmm. with and it leaves big chunks a lot of times. Whereas this is almost more like a plating, so there's a lot less to clean off, it's a lot easier. And that makes it a lot easier when you get into this area we were talking about before that's, that's really tight. The, if you don't have a lot there to clean off, it, it can be a lot easier. So these are some um, drawings I was doing to kind of figure out how I wanted the, the wards to be. Um, and I think mine differ from the original key, but they're similar to the wards in the lock we referenced. Um, and I ended up going with this one, except for I didn't have these cuts in the top and bottom. <clears throat> so this is the key that I was talking about that Doug had sent me. So on that Facebook group, um, I had posted pictures of the keys that I did, and I showed that I used my chisels and cut them radius. And he said, well, I have this key that I bought, and I've cut the bit off. There's a cut right, right here. He said, I cut the end of the bit off so I could kind of look in there and sort of see and try to figure out how they did this. He said, can I send it to you, and you give me your opinion of it? So he mailed it to me, which was good, because um, it allowed me to kind of take a look. So um, again, we can kind of look at this forensically and sort of figure out, well, how did they do it? Um, so again, there's the cut right here. So we're looking at this inside surface on the key bit, and then this surface on the whole piece that's cut off. So I believe this is looking at the end of the, the part still on the key. So this top section is the top part here. So you can see there's striation going this direction, um, which would be on this surface here, going perpendicular to the bit. 
So that tells me they were probably using a saw because that would be going perpendicular to the bit cutting down. So they're using a saw to cut down this way. But then if you look at this piece, which is the inside uh, surface of the bit that's cut off, they're going parallel to the bit, which means it had to have gone that direction. And if you're using a saw, it's going to go perpendicular. So you can't, that's not cut with a saw. That has to be cut in from this direction. So then you can see these little striations. That tells us they were using a chisel from the end to kind of cut in. Again, like in Donald Streeter's book, a lot of times he would cut those radiuses with a hole saw. Well, if you were using a saw, they'd be going this way. But we know they're not cut with a hole saw. And then you can see in this um, here, I'm not sure where it is, it's the bottom of one of these cuts somewhere, but you can see a little chip that was raised from a chisel and then just got left in the key. And then again here, you have the striations going this direction, <coughs> showing us that they were cutting in from the end. So how their chisel looked, what exactly it was, we don't know, but we can tell that it was at least cut in this direction, so it wasn't done with a saw. <clears throat> so this is a tool that I picked up from Kevin, but mine's slightly modified. I put this little piece on here, but I guess this is your what, key cutting anvil, I guess? Yeah, I, we put it in the vise and uh, grab it here with the vise. It supports the key, but it's a narrow enough uh, piece of steel so that the, the, uh, the, the stem of the key won't be marred uh, and uh, it, it supports just the bit of the key. So you can see here uh, how I was using it. So um, I guess I used it differently than Kevin. I think Kevin um, puts the bit up against this nub here where I was putting the bow on it. But either way, the bit is rested on this piece here. So it allows you to chisel into it to, to cut. So, so for um, this bit, I did cut down this plunge cut here with a hacksaw that had two blades on it to get the width that I needed. And then you can see me demonstrating here, these, these cross cuts were done with the chisels. So these are the hand chisels I made to kind of get all those cuts that I was talking about. Um, so basically you cut in as much as you can until you can get a needle file in there to help clean some of it up. Um, so this chisel wasn't super successful, but that was hopefully to get into like some of the corners. It's harder to get there. This chisel um, has a little bit of a bend, sort of this, like this. Um, that's what I use largely to cut the, most of the material out. This one's like a little cape chisel, basically, so it's the one I'm demonstrating here. It's got like a really blunt tip, um, so that way you don't chip off the little fine edge, and just allows you to kind of cut in and just slowly take off little chunks until it's wide enough to get your, your needle file in. <clears throat> and then this one is basically like a gouge chisel, and that's the one that I went in um, I guess if I had had the cuts right here, I would have went in on the edge rather than from the end. So this here is showing you, maybe hard to see on the screen, but the bottoms of these cuts are radius. They're not just straight through, and that was done with this little or this curved chisel here. And then here's a picture kind of showing um, how it corresponds to the bridge ward. I think how I got material it. you're taking off, Thomas. With each the chisel, a thirty-second of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch. Or? Probably a thirty-second, maybe a heavy thirty-second. Okay. Yeah, not a lot, and it was hard because. Um, so these chisels were all made out of some sort of mystery spring steel that I have. My uncle gave me a coffee can full of the stuff that was this size. It's basically, uh, I think it's a quarter inch, maybe three eighths of an inch by like an eighth of an inch. It was a like perfect size and I knew it was a spring steel so it could have some hardening to it. But they, the t I had to keep sharpening the tips kind of kept breaking on me a little bit and stuff so kind of taking off a little bit's more your friend because if you try to take too much it would really probably yeah. bugger up the end on it but um, yeah. So it's a, it's a tedious process. It kind of takes, takes some time but This is the sort of thing that probably got done a lot uh, by mostly gunsmiths in the colonies in uh, early America because there, there were so few specialist locksmiths. Um, and the, the gunsmiths were the people with the tools and, and uh, skill set that, that could probably work on locks and keys. Um, so here is my plate sock lock. Um, 
So these were basically door locks and they were from my research usually used on like an outbuilding or a street door or something where there would be a lot of water because um, the, the housing for it was wood so there's less likelihood of all the rust and stuff affecting it. And these were just simple um, deadbolts. And there were different kinds of them. Um, there was what's called a Banbury lock, which all of the pieces are, they're, they're not attached to each other like this, where this is like riveted. All the pieces are attached to the wooden housing. Um, and then, so that's just um, a stock lock or a plain stock lock, whereas this one's a plate stock lock because it's, it's on this plate and then housed into the wood. So there were a couple of variations. And they, they were all made around the same time period. I don't really know why you'd go with one over the other, maybe cost or something, but they were all made during the same time. So here's the original one that I picked up. You can see it's got that plate and then it's housed in this wooden block. And then here's a look at the lock itself. So it's a pretty simple mechanism. It's just a deadbolt. It's got the spring and the, um, the bridge board for the book key. So here's my drawing. Again, I, I kind of called out some of the parts for myself just because there's so much on top of each other. It's easier to, to call it out, and you can see them in the different views. So the blue is the tumbler, um, and I'll get into that a little later as to what that is exactly, and the red is the bolt. And this is a drawing um, to get the proportions of my bridge board. So that's, um, again, those, those are the, the little security features that correspond with the cuts and the key bit, and then the, the end of um, over here, this end. So this is where the bolt's coming through. <coughs> so here's my plate. Um, I punched all the holes first on this one. Um, whereas with the some of the other locks, we kind of did some of them as we went. This one, because it's a little more basic, I was able to do that. So got that all cut out, shaped, punched, decorated. This is the inside. So starting to locate, again, this is the standard, and then these are the cheeks for my bridge board, and this little nub is, I guess, the rest or the stop for the tumbler. So um, here's my bridge board, um, brazed in, so you can see all the little, little pieces, and this is the collar where they're all, got their bronze on them. And this is another view of it, so you can see they go through that plate, so they register to the key on both sides of the key. The key, can, the key can go through the lock either way. And then here's just kind of fitting, seeing if the key fits through. And I don't have the wards cut in the bit yet, but. <clears throat> so here's all the parts laid out. So I got the bolt at the top and the plate with all the pieces fixed. So this is the spring um, bridge ward in there, my key, the cover plate, and this is the tumbler. So this is a video explaining um, some of the parts and how it works. This is the stock lock, and the mechanisms inside work basically the same way as the rim lock. So there's the spring, the tumbler, and then here's the uh, ore box that the key can go into. So as the key comes around, it's engaging the tumbler, lifting it up, and it's um, going in between the talons on the bolt to slide it over. Part of the reason for the tumbler is this little nub right here coincides with this one on the bolt. So when the bolt is in the closed position, you can see those two nubs on the bolt and tumbler keeps it the bolt from sliding over. So as the tumbler goes up and the key <clears throat> goes in between the talons, it, it allows it to slide. So here you can see the lock without the bolt, the key lifts the tumbler, moving that nub out of the way, allowing for the bolt to slide. So, with the lock assembled, this is how it would function. And then, so there's my finished lock in, in the wood and my key for it. And then the finished uh, insides. <coughs> so then the, 
the big lock, the three bolt rim lock, we actually started this one first out of all the locks and it was the last one finished. It was a, a pretty big project. Um, and the functions of it inside with the tumbler and the spring and the bolt and all that, the way the stock lock works, this basically functions the same way, but it has other, other bolts and stuff. Um, but yeah, so this was a service mounted door lock and they came in one, two or three bolts. We did a three bolt. And um, this was a very um, kind of standard construction. So on the table, I have a little, I guess a closet lock, which is basically made the same way. It's just much smaller and it's just a dead bolt. So this is the original lock that Kevin has that we referenced. I didn't copy this one as closely as I did on the other locks. Um, so these locks are proportioned kind of off the shape of the key. So the original key we were going from wasn't the key to this lock. So because I was copying that key, I sized my lock to that key. So my lock is a little smaller than Kevin's. So I was referencing this one and a couple other locks that I had pictures of. Um, because actually when I was doing my drawing, for some reason I was having trouble fitting some of the parts and I kind of referenced what some other locks looked like. <clears throat> but the parts are all kind of the same, they're just maybe placed a little differently. So here's a look at the lock with the cover plate off and you can see the bridge board. So this is a three bolt rim lock because it's got the latch bar or bolt. So that's when you turn the door knob, that's what goes in and out and allows you to open the door. The dead bolt, for the main bolt, I guess, and then the privacy latch or the night latch, which is only accessible from the inside of the house. <coughs> so here you can kind of see um, what some of the proportions are. So they're based off of the the, the key height, so I guess this is one unit. Um, from the research that I did, they were, so I guess it's basically Donald Streeter and maybe that um, Canadian book, and I think maybe Peter Austin can kind of say that the, the, the proportions are basically four units high by six or seven long. Um, but I have three room locks on the table over there and they're closer to this dimension, which is basically three and a half tall by six long. So they were kind of in that realm of, of that size. So having the key that we were referencing, I was able to size my lock off of that. So my lock um, is kind of proportioned down from his original, but using these proportions, or scaled down, I guess I should say, but using these proportions. <coughs> so here's my, my drawing, and you can see this is my, my one unit. It's the height of my, my keyhole and key bit. So again, I've called out certain parts just to make it easier for me to tell what's going on, but this is the rough plan. Um, and then if you look at my sketchbook I have on the table, I have most of all of these parts drawn from like the side view as well, or both side views. That way I can determine the height of them and kind of how they all fit and relate to each other. Because you can only tell so much from this one view. So um, here's laying out the main plate, um, kind of figuring out where the bend is going to be and where uh, the bolts will be going through. So here I believe I'm cutting out um, where the bolts will be going through the edge. But again, I don't, did I cut? I cut all the way through those, right? Um, yeah. But they're undersized because if you were to cut those, if you look at the lock, the bolts basically come through at the bend. So if you were to cut those full size right from the get go, when you go to bend that, the, the edge isn't really going to want to bend with it. So you cut them undersized so there's material to move. And then you also file them open to fit them to the specific bolts that you made. So, but here I'm just kind of marking them in to, to get them cut. There's a lot of trying and thing. Filing, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, once I've got the edge bent up and, and the holes um, cut through, then I started fitting them to the bolts that I have. So here you can see the main bolt and the latch. And then I just had my key in there. So, I believe this is Kevin forging the main bolt. So this was... One of the first things you did. Yeah, this was a year ago. Yeah, this, this was <laughs> basically, yeah. Or maybe in December of last year.
basically he's marking out kind of where he wants to bend the material on the end. So you're starting with real thin material and you just keep bending it over until you build up the nose of that bolt to the height. So, bolt, so mostly that bolt is just a long thin piece except for the end. So he just keeps folding it, folding it. So you're saying just do as much squaring up as you can now because as you bend it's, the ends are usually radi uh, round and radius so he's just trying to chew them up a little bit so here's forge welding so kind of making all those folds just one mass and then defining the shape of them So the next video is going to be him doing um, the latch bar. Um, the end of it's the same. It's just thin material fold up until you have the mass that you want. So I didn't put that part in. But the tricky thing with this, and I have two of them over there that I um, didn't end up putting into my lock. They have um, what's called an upset corner. Two of them in different planes right on top of each other. So it's kind of a tricky little forging. And so an upset corner is... Again, when you bend something, it's usually a radius. So if you're upsetting, you're putting material back into that corner so you can have a nice sharp corner. So to do two of those right on top of each other in two different planes is kind of tricky, which is why I did three of them, because those two, they just didn't make the cut for me. Uh, I think one of them has a cold shut, which is basically material folding in on itself, which becomes a weak point and it can break. And then I think the other one, I just didn't have the the, the corners as tight as I wanted, I believe, is why I didn't um, end up using that one. It's a, it's a tricky forging. It's kind of fun, though. Definitely good practice. <coughs> so he's holding onto the nose that's already been folded and built up like the other bolt. So he's marking out his bending, and he did the first bend. You see how radius that corner is? It's just really, really rounded over. So now he's upsetting it in to, to get that a nice, tight, sharp corner. And you have to keep working that corner from both sides to kind of move the material evenly. Otherwise, your corner is going to migrate. So now it's much sharper. And now he's doing the second bend. So it's right after that bend, it's bent on the other plane. It's a tricky little thing. And then you got to upset that corner. The, I believe these are the two that I did put, and this might be a picture starting to clean up the one that I did use. But you can see here, it's got the bend this way and then a bend that way. So they're, they're, they're pretty tricky. So, again, I have the second end bent up, and then I've got my latch, the main bolt, and then this is the, the privacy bolt. You can see I've got my keyhole marked for where it'll go. So here I've got the staples that they secure the bolts in, um, and then I've got the sides of my bridge ward. And so this is um, taking a look at the bridge ward and how I kind of made this complex ward here. It's the C-shape sort of. So I have a flat piece of material here, and you can see these um, marks scratched and that was where I was going to bend it. So I kind of used this little mandrel to bend it around and then I used a hand bender to give it this radius bend. So even though they're really short, they actually have a slight bit of a radius to them. And that again corresponds to the, the key and the arc cut in the bit of my key. And these ones were made the same way, they're just straight so they just have a little bit of a radius to them. And then here's a video which kind of illustrating how the key sweeps through them, kind of interacts with them. <laughs> these these wards were what kept a foreign key from turning in a lock uh, up until uh, the late 1700s it was really the only security locks had and uh, in I think 17 70s or 80s, a fellow by the name of Barron in England 
came up with another, uh, uh, came up with a different type of tumbler, which had to be raised to a specific height so that the bolt would move. And if the key didn't have that little precise step in it, it, it wouldn't work. And uh, that was the beginning of the abandonment of warded locks and, uh, of, and, and the move towards higher security, basically. They used the multi-tumbler multi locks still today for the keys that unlock uh, combination lock spindles on, on uh, safes and vaults. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, those videos are referenced from Peter Ross at the beginning. I think in one of those videos, he basically says something along the lines of, all you have to do to get enough variations out of these is to try to make every key the same and they'll all be different. Because it's all handmade. <laughs> so. <clears throat> yeah. And this is a video of me um, making the tumbler for, I think, the rim lock. The one I make in the video is not the one that actually went into my lock because there were a couple flaws that I didn't like, but the, the process is the same. So here I'm uh, necking down a little bit of material for the, the hinge plate of it at the back. So I'm just drawing that material out. Making sure my measurements are all where I want them to be. I'm trying to draw out material for the bump at the bottom and then the, the material at the top to fold over. Just stretching that out, shaping it out. And I'm drawing down the back side of it, which um, is where it would rest on the stock. And you can see the one here that I'm referencing for shape. Punching out the, the eye. Again, measuring. That's for where I want the, the part to be folded over. And that's that stub that interacts with the this here, that interacts with the bowl. So that one picture at the end is not the one I forged, but it is the one that went into my lock. Or, I forged it, just not in that video. <laughs> so here you can see, again, it's really similar to the stock lock. It's got the scotch spring on top, and then it's got um, the tumbler here, and then the, the bridge board. And, and we haven't yet found out why it's called a scotch spring. Is that you? No, that's, so that, again, that, that red-covered Canadian book has a, a glossary in there. That's a term I picked up out of that book. Uh, the terminology with some of the stuff, it's, I, even I guess on that group we had, it's kind of been a, a debated topic. It's hard because different countries had different terms for things, and because a lot of us are relearning some of this information, we don't necessarily know what people of the time period would have called things in all cases. So sometimes people are giving it their own name, sometimes they're using the name from one country, sometimes they might have the right, it's just, it's, and people call stuff whatever, so there's a glossary in that book, and kind of he makes a point there to say that it's it's kind of important for all of us to sort of get on the same page for what they're called so that way everyone knows what everyone's talking about but it's not necessarily that case. So Thomas, was it colloquial in the colonies? Uh, like somebody in Pennsylvania would be using terminology that someone in New Hampshire would not use? Maybe, um, because the locks in Pennsylvania were Germanic and not English. So they could have been using a different term. Yeah. But, yeah, they probably had a completely different set of terms. And mm -hmm. even now, uh, the old English terminology in England differs from American mm -hmm. lock terminology. Too, yeah. We call it a post where the, the, that the key goes on to and turns. In England, they call it a drill <coughs> key. But it's the same thing. <laughs> So it's it's kind of hard to get everyone on the same page because so we call potato chips potato chips they right it's, it's that sort of thing basically yeah. and we call them French fries and they call them chips <laughs> <laughs> we had a a debate recently even on the cuts in the key bit of what those are called keyways wards yeah on that that group yes <laughs> it, can get, it can get heated. <laughs> So here's a video of me just kind of um, testing out the key and just sort of showing how it throws the bolt. Again, just like the stop lock.
So um, this is my rough forging of the cam, and the cam is what the, um, the spindle for the, the doorknobs goes through. So as you turn the doorknob, the cam here is what acts on the bottom leg of the latch. So you can turn it either way. You can see it goes either direction. So whichever way you turn it, the latch is going to retract. Um, so this is just a picture of the outside of the case. Um, and you just kind of rivet it over and it's sort of domed in there. It's an interesting fitting. So you can see the material here is raised up slightly. So there's a hole in the case of the lock that that goes through, which the hole in the lock is slightly chamfered on the outside. And you just sort of chase the material lightly so that it's enough for it to grab on so it can't pull through, but it can still freely turn. It's tricky. <laughs> That's a really tricky part of making one of these latches. Not over tightening? Or Not over tightening. Although you can always get a little it. oil yeah. in there and work at it, but you'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh no. I just hit the button. Yeah, you gotta turn it back on. So this will be a slide of the side rails on my rim lock. Um, they're tapered, they're little wedges, they're not just flat pieces. Um, and they're attached really similarly to how the, the frame is attached on the padlock with the T-rivets, the but in this case the rim rivets, and they're only attached on two, the two places, so one end and the side. Um, this will warm up in a second, but so this is showing a cross section, so you can see that it's a tapered wedge, and then it's it's just the back side. There we go. And at the top here, once it warms up, is my spring. So there you go. You can see this is the spring on top. And we're up forging my my Scotch spring, and then these are the two um, side rails of the lock, and then these are the rim rivets. So they're cut flush on top because they don't attach to anything because that's the edge that'll be against the door. <coughs> and then the post on the bottom here, I just haven't trimmed and, and filed to be a um, tenon to go through the lock. And then here you can see that it's a, it's a slight taper. It's not greatly, but it's, it's a little bit. It's about half the thickness here as it is here. And I believe they were an inch and a quarter tall. So it's not a huge change, but they are slightly tapered. I don't know why they did that, I think. In the video that I had, Peter speculated that it might be just to give it a, a stronger appearance or something. I don't know. It, it was, I think it was mostly cosmetic. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, you see them uh, without that taper, the, without a, like a, a angled box. Uh, and even later on the so-called carpenter locks, they were often made like a channel, like a of channel iron in miniature. I think you can still get the stuff too. And <clears throat> some of the later ones, the, the box itself was just completely cast, but the pieces were still forged the same way. And the cast ones, I've seen them with like profile shapes and stuff. They're not necessarily like this. Some of them were, and some, some weren't. And some, some of these rim locks were uh, made on a, a, just a, a plate and then they were screwed into cast brass bodies so that they had a nice brass box on the door. So this is just a look at the, the spring here. That's the spring for the latch. Um, so this is the, this V spring is the earlier style. And then later on they switched to this lever mechanism. So this back one is the spring and then this is just a little lever. Um, so as it, the, the latch retracts, it just kind of pushes on the spring there rather than the whole thing being a spring. I don't, I don't think we know why they changed it. They just did for some reason. I, I think that the, the spring and lever and the V-spring actually coexisted was, um, because I've seen some fairly early locks with the spring and lever. I, I think they did that because it was a little smoother. There wasn't as much, uh, yeah, there wasn't as much um, winding or, or uh, gaining 
resistance as you turn the knob. It was a smooth. Because it's hard, harder to turn it one way. Yeah. And uh, I think that the spring and lever was a way of evening out that force. And uh, this is the one that you had, Russell, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so here's mine. Um, we did the, the B spring. That was what was in the original that we were referencing. So I went with that. So then this is an inside look at the keeper. So this is what would be attached to the door frame. So that's what the bolt throws into to, to lock it. Um, so these were made in three different ways and they um, varied in price. So the cheapest way was basically the whole thing was one piece of sheet metal. So the ends were folded and the, the backside here were just all folded out of one piece of flat sheet metal. <coughs> Then the middle one would be um, basically that, and then the edge would be rolled up. So there, you can't see it here, but there's a, on mine I have a brass, or I guess it would be this edge here actually, would just be rolled up from that sheet. And then the most expensive one was the way I did it, where the this back rail is attached with these rim rivets, just like on the housing of the lock. And then there's a brass rub rail on the side, which you'll be able to see, I think, in a different picture. but. So um, all the brass pieces I cast myself for the lock. So this is my wooden pattern for my mold, and then here's the brass rub rail. So it's got these three tenons that tenon through the case. So there you can see the, the rub rail riveted on. And here you can see the, the, the angle on the latch bar going up against that radius edge of the rub rail is kind of, it, it helps it to retract. So it's it's not it's there for I guess decoration. It looks nice and stuff, but it's also there um, to help push the the latch in and protect the edge of the box and whatnot. It does strengthen it too. Yeah. Against the being right people trying to break the door down. Yeah, trying to slam <laughs> it shut with the bolt out or something. Yeah. So then here's just sort of a layout of all the pieces, mostly in my lock. Um, so like I said, we basically started this lock on day one with the plate, and that was the last thing that I finished up. <laughs> we, I mean, we worked on all these just kind of parts here and there and this and that, and skipped around through them. But this one had the most parts and most work to it, so we got started on it early, and then worked our way through them all. So then there's basically my lock finished up. And then the, uh, so this is what you would see um, as it was mounted on the door. So then, um, there were a couple different types of knobs that these locks would have had. I wanted these um, oval or kind of football shaped, sometimes they're called like egg knobs. Um, I could not for the life of me find them anywhere. I couldn't find decent reproductions, I couldn't find exorbitantly priced original, like I couldn't find nothing. Luckily, um, like I said, um, Jordan had a lock that he found in the house he purchased. It was up in his attic with the original knobs. So he gave me tons of photos and measurements and references. Uh, it was super helpful. So these originally were three-piece construction. So the two halves, the two hemispheres of the, the knob were hollow, actually. And then the spindle was a third piece. And they were all cast out of brass, and they were all braised together or silver soldered or, or whatever. Um, so I went up to um, actually Bob Menard's shop in Portland, because um, that's where my friend Nick works out of, Nick Downing, and he let me use his casting frames and his sand and he, sh he showed me how to do it. Um, so this is a video of, of me um, casting the parts for the log. Here I'm packing one of the frames with the, the casting clay, and this is this isn't the exact material they would have used at the time, but I mean the, the process is pretty much the same. So I packed it with the the one side down, so it's nice and flat. So that's actually the side that is up now is the inside of the mold. So here, because it's hollow, I'm packing material in there, and I just scored it so I had something to kind of grab onto. Um, Push my pieces in. This is a parting compound, so the two halves will come apart. And I put 
the top frame on, back it again. too much then you change the shape of the mold. And here I'm carving little gates so that way when I pour the brass it'll run from one piece into the other. So here I'm casting the knob and the slider for the privacy bowl. Right now I'm carving out the, the cone at the top, the, the screw. You can see pieces in the back that are already cast there. Forge. We were using a gas forge to heat up the crucible to mount all the little brass. Pour in the brass. And it pours really fast. It's crazy how fast it goes. It goes so fast, half the time I was like, well, that didn't get into the bottom section of the mold, but it did. <laughs> I was a little hesitant to pull apart. I thought it was going to be. It was, it was fine, though. And I'm just kind of punching it. So there's one half of the doorknob, and then this is the slider for the privacy latch. So then here's, again, this is the outside and this is the inside of the, the two halves for the doorknobs. This is the privacy latch slider, and then this is the spindle for the, the bottom of the knob. And then this is a piece, I just needed a piece of 3 8 inch round so I can make this little nut. So there's my finished knobs. Those are three pieces. Um, braced together with brass, and then the spindle in the middle is just um, steel. <clears throat> so there's the finished lock with my knobs in there, the key, and there's a picture of us. <laughs> <laughs> so that was everything. That was uh, all the stuff we were doing. Does anybody have questions on anything? Or? How much time do you have in each one of those blocks, you think? So, um, I didn't actually really track my time on any of this stuff, just because it's the first ones I've ever made, I was more focused on getting them done. So I don't actually know how much time was in each individual lock. I do know that on the second padlock, so the one that's based off the original pattern, not Kevin's pattern, it took me about 20 hours, I think, on that one. Um, so we spent 91 hours together, and I kind of estimate I probably spent at least four times that much time on my own, which kind of roughly works out to about an hour a day, which probably makes sense because some days I did nothing, some days I did three or four hours. So I kind of think that I probably did at least four times that, that much. So how much of that time went into which parts, I don't know. But I, I, I do try to track some of my other stuff now, but at the time I just... It was too much to kind of, yeah. it took us a year really, so, and then it's, I didn't have time to write that down, I guess. Yeah. On your brass rug rail, hmm? did you get into using a shrink rule? No. So you're simply casting the piece and then matching the piece to the lock? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you're, because you're talking about how there's a little bit of a shrinkage to it and that kind yes. of stuff. Yeah, in different I, to this, yeah. I I had looked up how much the shrinkage rate would be. I don't remember what it was, but it was so minuscule on brass that I just didn't really worry about it. Um, I, on my knobs itself, like it, it didn't really, it didn't, matter, it didn't seem to be too much. The rub rail, because it had to match the length, um, I think I could tell that it was just a hair smaller than I kind of wanted it to be, but it was so close. I, yeah, I don't remember what the number was, but it was, it was like, let's say over, I don't know if it was over an inch or over a foot or something. It, it was like, maybe over a foot, it was like a sixteenth of an inch or something like that. I don't remember, but it was it was small. Yeah, I think cast is an eighth to the foot. Okay, I don't remember, but it it wasn't much. Yeah. Yeah, but so I did, I made, I had to make my pattern, and because it was hollow, I thought it would be easier to do it with metal, just because I, I think it was like an eighth of an inch thick, and I'm not a woodworker, and I thought like it wouldn't, will go well for me to do that of wood. So I, I made a swage and I swaged a piece for my pattern. Um, so 
with that part, even though it maybe shrank a little bit, I actually then put it in the swage and I hammered it a little bit more to shape. So probably stretched it out to the final length anyways, at least on the, the football shape part. So, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. The Corning Glass Museum, in addition to showing you what Pyrex looks like, has all kinds of historical stuff, and I'm wondering if any of the lock manufacturing companies are interested in this sort of historical approach to older locks, in terms of displays, in terms of where we came from, so Well, I... Or is this just such a, a small group of aficionados that there's no, you know, American Lock Museum? Well, it's there is an American. Yeah. There is the Lock Museum of America, Terryville, in Terryville, Connecticut, it's, uh, west of Hartford. Uh, they have uh, a lock there on the early manufactured locks, uh, many of much of which started out right in that area in Terryville, and Bristol, and Plymouth, Connecticut, um, in the very early 1800s uh, and they got a lot of uh, material from uh, Russell Irwin and uh, which is now known as Russland, um, Yale and, and other big uh, and Eagle Yale Lock. The Lock Company, not the yeah. University. <laughs> Yale yeah. the Lock Company. Um, and uh, the Eagle Lock, the Eagle Cabinet Lock Company was in in Terryville. And they also had a lot. There's a lot of the, the early American lock making history is there. Uh, a lot of modern lock people really, uh, the industry, I think, sort of poo-poo's the older locks because they're selling security. Mm -hmm. uh, and all, of course, the old-fashioned locks, the pre-industrial locks were, you know, they, they just sort of downplay them. Of course, now, if you have a lock like that on your door, you, nobody's going to pick it with a uh, pin tumbler fix. <laughs> <laughs> they won't get in that way. I think, uh, to kind of answer your question, too, a little bit, um, so all the lock companies like you were naming, they were with the Industrial Revolution, so they weren't making any of these kind of locks. So they didn't make these. I would guess they probably wouldn't be displaying them because that's not what they did. Um, but there are some places that do kind of go into some of the stuff. So for instance, Colonial Williamsburg, they make some of these sometimes. Um, Peter Ross, one of the names I said, he was the master of the shop there. Now it's Ken Schwartz, who was another guy I talked to. They have an apprenticeship program there and I think as part of their like final test to pass whether or not they become a journeyman is they have to make a rim lock. So they're doing some of the work there. I know there's an old historic shop. I believe it's in DC or it's close by. I think it's called G. Krug and Son and it's been around for a while. And I, they used to do some lock work and someone else that I um, have been in contact with on Instagram lives close by, I think, and he's visited. And they do have some old kind of incomplete locks in that shop. I don't know if they were made there or not. I would assume they were, but so, yeah, I mean, most of these were imported from England. They weren't made here, per se, so I don't know that, yeah. Interestingly, they continued to be made largely by hand and largely in the, uh, what we know now as the medieval craft method, where Joe was really good at making those rim rivets and he did it all day and and Pete was a great key cutter and you know they, they divided the labor and would, would produce things well into what we think of as the industrial age in the eighteen forties, fifties and sixties. Yeah, so I, I guess that's something we didn't really touch on is whereas we made every part for like I made every piece of that lock, that's not how it really was done. They were there were people that did each part and the 
the key and the bridge board would have come from another shop. Yes. But they fit into the locks that they made. In a lot of cases, the the stock lock makers would have sent the boy down for some more keys and, and bridge wards from the key stamper and ward box maker down the street, who also made the good beer, so they could probably come back with a growler as well. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and there, there was a town in England, or is a town in England, Willenhall was the center of lock making. And it got to the point where so many people were engaged in lock making, so many were trained in lock making, that no one could just do things, you know, they couldn't make a living just making locks or lock parts. So you had in the census uh, uh, and of trades, you had a lock, stock lock maker and, and uh, publican greengrocer and bolt maker and uh, key stamper and registrar of births. <laughs> so they, they kind of cobbled together livings in a community by just doing everything. Are there any of the books that you could recommend based, uh, besides the one you mentioned in the game? I guess it depends what you're looking for. Um, in terms of like the locks that we made, no, that's the most information I've been able to find. There are a lot of, um, well, there aren't a lot of books that talk about the construction of locks. There are a lot of books on locks in Europe, but the problem for us is they're in German or they're in French or Italian. Or Italian, yeah. So they have really good reference pictures of like this view of a lock, but you can't see the other views and you don't necessarily see all the inner workings and they don't tell you how they were made. It's just a good picture of a nice yeah. lock. So there's lots of those, but most of them are in Europe and they're expensive to get over here. And if, and if you can read French, there are books, uh, there are uh, in the what, 1760s, Diderot true, wrote, yeah. wrote encyclopedias of crafts and trades and there's a lot about lock making in his and there's another, uh, <coughs> Du Hamel de yeah. Monceau wrote a rather, had a rather exhaustive book of lock making. I think he published that in 17, the late 1700s. But it's French lock making, it's a little yeah. different. <laughs> and it's in French, archaic French too, if I'm correct. So it's, it's hard to find info on the, the construction of them. We're going to have to start whacking steel <laughs> and filing. The together. easiest thing is if you can get your hands on an original and just look at it, which is what we did. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Very thank you very much. Very much. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, and like I said, I've got stuff to want to look at. Hey everybody, I just want to briefly mention a few things. Um, if you enjoy this video, then please head on over to Instagram and check out some more of my work uh, at Greasy Luck Forge. Also, if you go to my website, greasyluckforge.com, you can buy some stuff um, like this support sticker and the sale of those things help me out um, to afford my supplies and whatnot. Also, eventually I'd like to start doing more videos. I'm not sure when that's gonna happen, but uh, if you wanna stay up to date with that, and um, see when those pop up, then please hit the subscribe button. And um, yeah, thanks for following along.